Our next guest is a correspondent on The Daily Show and is also the host of The Daily Show's Beyond the Scenes podcast. Please welcome to the South by Southwest studio, Roy Wood Jr. That was, that was awesome. <laughs> you, you own the seat. You were How much, you doing? You are much taller in real life. That's Somebody right? told me I sound short. I don't know what that means, but you, I'll take it. Yeah, you, you sound larger than life and you look much taller yeah, so you it's, know it's what a it compliment is? sir the problem is that on the daily show set trevor's chair for the camera angles to work when right. we're doing chats one of us has to be at a different elevation and it's always trevor taller than me it's and lies it's, it's, the, it's the hierarchy of the daily show even the, even He's when you six sit. foot i'm six foot one respect my one inch <laughs> i respect it I i'm give sorry you for taking out frustrations on you so you, you seem could, like a nice you person. flex that one inch at the south by southwest dude the world needs to know <laughs> You have an uh, amazing new comedy special on Comedy Central and on Paramount Plus. Yes, right. Yes. Uh, Imperfect Messenger. Yes, sir. Very funny. Thank you. It's a pandemic. We're still in a pandemic. Mm. How do you prepare a special during a pandemic? Do you do it in front of the mirror? Is it in front of your family? <laughs> like, do you, do you well, wear the mask and go out to the clubs? I did some club sets, but the thing that was frustrating was that in the middle of 2020 and early 21, before we taped at the end of 21, was that a lot of the clubs on the road were in hotspot states. Yeah. And you know, I'm homeschooling a five-year-old, I have my girl, like, it, you, you have to be cognizant of Same what boat. you're passing on to everybody else. And so New York seemed decent-ish enough where we started just doing shows where we were bagging people's phones and we told the people for the show, this is new jokes, this is experimental. Mm. So when people came into the space knowing that we were trying to create something, in a way it accelerated the creative cycle. So we were able to get accomplished in eight months what normally would take a year and a half on the road. Super focused. Like, yeah, because if you're doing two one-hour shows a night in New York and the audience knows this new jokes and they're giving you feedback, that's way better than being in, say, St. Louis or even Austin, which are all great comedy markets, but you aren't able to get the repetition during the week. You cannot do two show. You cannot do two one-hour shows on a Tuesday night in middle America, but you can in New York City. In New York City, you can. So it gave. It just increased the the volume of content that I was able to workshop, and that's how we were able to get it done. Because how long did I, it take you to workshop it to get it up? Uh, about a year. That's that's whew. during there a pandemic. Was, that's amazing. On when the pandemic started, I had 40 minutes of material. And once I started looking at what I wanted to talk about for the special, I really only had 10 minutes. Because any joke you had in 2019, for the most part, it's tone deaf, it's out of touch. It doesn't connect with where we are as a people now. That's right. And that was also the important thing, which I really have to give props to Comedy Central on. We shot the special at the top of October of 21. It was on air by Halloween, two weeks later. Ooh. Because we want topical. We wanted the quick turn. Yeah. Because the news keeps changing, dog. Well, now we got a war in you, Ukraine. So, so, well, we didn't <laughs> three weeks ago, <laughs> right. but now we do. So imagine if you had a special that you shot in October that's finally coming out in March. It may not quite touch on the pulse of where we are as a people, and I think that's a byproduct of us going from a 24-hour news cycle to a 12-hour news cycle to what I believe is really eight hours, like. Now it's a TikTok news cycle. Bro, there's stuff that happens at sunrise that's not even news by sunset. Well, in 2020, uh, America was in a diversity, but now that's like, you know, it's, it's too much. Yeah, we're done. We're yeah, done, we're with, done that. with that. Yeah. I have we to put ask, up a black square. Yeah, it was, oh, but that yeah, it was, it was too much. It was two, <laughs> two steps forward, one step back. We had, now we have to ban books. I have to ask you about <laughs> Ryan Coogler, all right, director of Black Panther. Yeah, Yesterday. Yeah. Robbing was, the bank, wasn't he? The, yeah. <laughs> Heard Ryan Coogler was robbing banks, wearing a bank robbing R ring with R Ryan with Keith Stanfield. He was not robbing. Uh, <laughs> he was not robbing a bank. No. He actually went to take out money uh, from his bank, uh, and he's wearing a mask. And because he's a black man taking out a lot, lot, lot of bills, uh, the cops came, and on the body cams, they thought that this man was robbing the bank because he wrote down that he wanted to withdraw twelve thousand dollars because he was being cognizant of a pandemic and didn't want to yell and scream it. Because we all know that's not the safe way to get money from a bank. Especially it's as just a black man. walk in and go, I need $12,000 right now. Like, Woo, boop, boop. With a mask. Yeah, that's not the right. But it, th what's wild about that story is that he'd already put his card in, put in his PIN number, right. which verifies he's the account holder. Or at least 
has the pin number of the account. He holder. did everything right. He did everything right. And do, you, do you think if he entered the if he entered the bank said I directed Black Panther, I directed Black Panther, everyone, I'm Ryan Coogler, I directed Black Panther, Black Panther, the movie you love, I directed, and I'm taking out twelve thousand dollars. Ryan Coogler could walk into the Ryan Coogler Savings and Trust loan that was founded by Ryan Coogler, and it is still possible in America that he would get detained for suspicion of robbery. And the question I want to ask you then is what's happening in America, what happened to Ryan Coogler, and I know you're following the news in Ukraine, two million immigrants, uh, now, they're, now they're refugees, right? So they're, right. they're refugees now. We're seeing racism play out even in Ukraine where African immigrants and African workers I'm in Ukraine are, are, are treated second. They're saying we are being abused, mocked, ridiculed, literally told to go back. Where is it safe in the world right now to be a black man? At your house. Well, not even at your house. I mean, just, I mean, just in your house, like unless the landlord coming by, like <laughs> that might be the only place. Um, racism doesn't take any days off, and I think that's the thing that's really shocking about what's happening over there. And you know, and I'll be honest, you know, as a black person, you know, there is a level of empathy that you have for anyone that's being displaced by this crisis. Right. But then, as a black person, you look at what's happening to people who look like you, and there is a level of anger and resentment that you carry that is hard to let go of in spite of the catastrophes that are superseding all of that. And it's very difficult as a black person, at least as a black American, to sparse the two, you know? Yeah. It, it's all related. And that part of it is something that, you know, that I hope at some point, once we're on the other side of this, that we can have a real conversation about, about just the way people are treated. Like, we're just talking common decency. But why do you have to pause that conversation? Because can't we expand our appetite for generosity and empathy and hold multiple concerns at the same time? Like, for example, I think, I'm going to make an assumption, you care deeply about the two million Ukrainians who are fleeing their country because Putin had an illegal war. Correct. At the same time, there's Haitians. At the same time, Correct. there's Yemeni refugees. At the same time, there's Afghans. Nigerians. This, Nigerians, right? This is happening right now. Ethiopia. So it, can we not use this example to say, yo, wait a second. If we care so much about Ukrainians as we should, can we also not care about these black and brown folks who also need our help? You can try, man, but this social media, we are one issue argument at a time society. So the moment you show concern about anything that's not rocking with the populace, you're seen as someone that's counterculture. Mm. And somehow if you are pro, if you are anti-racism in Ukraine, it could be twisted as being anti-Ukrainian right. refugee. Well, it's already been twisted You're anti-Christ. How dare you bring up the... I'm also anti-dogs. There's a bunch of dogs and animals over there that have been displaced as well. Daily Show's raising money and sitting money over there for that. So, yes, you can have a two-part argument because what's, what's interesting is that if you have the argument about animals, no one's bringing up the, du the duality of that. <laughs> they right. go, oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, the animals. Take care of the take animals, care of those. But if you bring up black people, they go, oh, how dare you? Hold on, hold on now. Which in their lies implicit bias by the people who were looking. I mean, Trevor did this on the show uh, last week when how everyone is shocked that this is happening in Europe. You would expect this in Africa, but not oh, they're openly in Europe. Saying, openly saying. Oh, you're, Trevor showed a whole run a great clip. of reporters just shocked. These white people, why is this happening to white folks? In Europe, which uh, has a bloody history. So there's a lot of inherent bias and a lot of anti-blackness that I think is just unconsciously seeped into our minds in how we look at different crises in this country. And that bias... That's the part of it that I don't like. That bias, the lack of framing, is represented in the lack of representation. And you're actually here at South by Southwest to talk to black... talk with black journalists about that lack of representation in journalism. Yeah, and it's just that that... That plays a huge role in how the stories are disseminated, how the stories are, how our stories are told in a way that is tasteful and doesn't come across as someone trying to take anything away from anybody else that is suffering. Me acknowledging my pain is not me disrespecting or disavowing your own. And I think that's the part, that's the nuance of the conversation that we still have not grasped as a country, you know, I don't know if- Roy, you're not will. trying to replace anyone. No, <laughs> no, not in the least. I just, I don't know, it, it's, it's frustrating. But yeah, representation in the newsroom, you know, is very important because 
there are a lot of news directors, you know, and to no fault of their own, that you just may have a blind spot. You just don't know what you don't know sometimes. And so it is important to have people on your crew that are covering the news right. who understand it from a perspective that is different from your own. And oftentimes that perspective and that story which is excised from the narrative. That's Correct. why you need people like us there. I wish I had more time with you. I could talk to you for 20 more minutes. Well, I would love but, to. But listen, you're here. you got a great special called Imperfect Messenger. It's yes. on Comedy Central. It's on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, last question. We talked about a lot of sober stuff that's happening, a lot of challenges. What's giving you joy right now? Ooh. What is giving me joy? I like watching Abbott Elementary. That's a great show. On ABC. That makes me laugh. I like that show. I like Ozark. I have a child. I guess I should say that. You should. You gotta, you gotta bring in the five rule. Yeah, I, my child brings me joy, and he is the greatest thing. That I, I just like that the child came after Ozark, which which kept it real. My child <laughs> tried to eat dirt the other night. You, you know, you can't give kids too much credit. They still <laughs> do stuff to infuriate you. It's a five-year-old, man. It's a pandemic. Nah, give, he's got to give man him a pass. Up. No, he's got to grow up. Uh, last, uh, you want to <laughs> give a shout-out? I know you're a, a sportsman. Uh, who do you want to give a shout-out to, your sports team? Uh, Chicago Cubs, sign someone, please. Jesus, the lockout's over. Just uh, sign someone. I don't even care who. Just sign a person who can hit the ball. And tomorrow, uh, about the podcast, you got a podcast, uh, you're, yeah, you're filming tomorrow, it tomorrow. Yeah, 2.30, it'll, it starts at 2.30, and we're going to be speaking with some wonderful, wonderful black journalists. We're going to be speaking with uh, Simone D. Sanders, who was formerly oh, yeah. with, um, with uh, VP Kamala Harris. She's now CNN. CNN. Yeah, you meet Michelle Cinder, and of course, my homie Vladimir from uh, CBS Morning News. So Oh, nice. It's going to be a good time. So it's man. tomorrow, 2.30. Tomorrow, you guys, 2:30. if you're watching... Come check out Roy at 2.30 tomorrow, Saturday, South by Southwest. Also, check out his Comedy Central special, Imperfect Messenger. He's six foot one. He's one inch taller than Trevor Noah. The world needs to know. And we found out at South by Southwest. Tell Thanks so truth. much. Thanks so much Stop for joining with us. the lies. <laughs> you can watch all of our studio interviews on the South by Southwest TV app, available Trevor, on Apple I'm TV. Trevor, I'm an inch taller than you, and you know it. Lower your chair. Roku, Android TV, and Amazon Fire. These interviews are also available on your YouTube channel at youtube.com slash sxsw. For a complete list of our interview schedule, check out sxsw.com slash studio. I'm Ajatali with the six foot one Roy Wood Jr. <laughs> Thanks for watching.